Hello, everyone. It's uh, Friday, June the 12th. Uh, I guess before I go any further, we've, we've lost another great West Virginian, our 86th death, a 50-year-old man from Mineral County. Uh, you know, it's really tough when you think about losing someone that's uh, in their 90s or upper 80s, and, and you think of... Uh, what a wonderful life that they had and a long life. And, uh, but when you start losing people that are 50 years old, I mean, it's, it's, just, uh, it's just a crying shame that, uh, that this killer virus is just stripping away, you know, loved ones from, or great West Virginians from, from, from all of our loved ones and everything that, uh, and it's really hard to understand. It, uh, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record. I don't want to ever do that. But, uh, you know, please keep this gentleman in your thoughts, your prayers. Kathy and I sure will. Uh, what a lot of life that was left, you know, for this family and this man. And, uh, and so please... Uh, just, just let's just never, never let these people become statistics. 86 great West Virginians, and uh, we love them. We love their families. We love their loved ones, and we absolutely want them to never feel alone. So, uh, so please keep them in your thoughts and your prayers. Prayer is so meaningful, and uh, some way, somehow, they'll feel you, you know, as you express your love. Uh, we have to continue to go forward. It's week seven of our West Virginia Strong, the comeback reopening. The guidances are up, you know, on our website and everything. Week eight will begin on Monday with, and, and Brother Jordan, if you'll get week eight up there, you know, well, you've got week nine, but, but we'll, that's all right. We'll just go with week nine for right now. You'll see all the things that are, are happening in week nine. We, we, we caution and we tell everyone just this. These are things that we now condone from a state standpoint that you can do. If you choose not to do this, like whatever it may be, you know, a soccer league or something like that that may be in the city of Charleston and they decide they, they're going to play in the fall or they're going, to, they're going to just forego the summer situation because we have vacations for kids and the kids are booked on vacations and all kinds of stuff like that. Or they just feel more comfortable not doing that and everything. That's great. That's absolutely great. This is not in any way mandated and everything. We're going to have a little league in every city all the way across the state or we're going to have you know, youth soccer everywhere. That, that's not the case at all. This is just giving you the very best guidelines and allowing you to know that from the state standpoint, we're okay. You know, you make the decisions. Now, let me, let me kind of uh, go over something that, with you that just, I just got. And this tickles me absolutely to death. You know, my wife Kathy really got behind communities and schools. Our first lady. And, and, and basically, one of the first dollars to give us the ability to, to start off going was, that's where I donated my salary. So my salary, you know, went right there in the beginning. Now, since that time, the legislature is giving us more, more opportunities and, and gone along with... Uh, the, the idea that this, that this concept was really good, and I have been, I have been a thousand percent behind this. Our first lady has done remarkable with this. All the people that are working with her have done unbelievable work. But now let me just read this to you and just tell you just how incredible this program really is. It's, it's today... I have some really incredible news to share about communities and schools in West Virginia. This year, 10 out of the 13 high schools with seniors in, communities and school, in the Communities and Schools program exceeded, exceeded 
their overall graduate graduation rate at the school. Now, that in itself, I mean, just think about this. These kids in communities and schools were kids that were in some way, somehow, possibly lost. They may have been hungry. They may have need, needed a, just a helping hand, just a kind voice. Just, they may have needed a jacket. I mean, for crying out loud, you know, it is unbelievable that these kids were kids that we were losing in lots of ways. Ten out of the 13 schools that they were in, these kids exceeded the overall graduation rate of the school. You know, it, uh, in eight out of the 13 schools, these kids and these seniors in this program had a 100% graduation rate. It's just unbelievable. You know, in Raleigh County, at Woodrow Wilson, these kids had a 92% graduation rate, and the overall school graduation rate was 80. In Cabell County, these kids had an 83% graduation rate, and the overall school graduation rate was 74. Communities and Schools is currently in 15 counties at a total of 120 different schools through the incredible work of the First Lady of the State Board of Education and all, we are working to expand communities and schools statewide. You know, it, uh, I wanna thank all those involved in this program so much, especially my wife, Kathy, cause she is all in, in, in regard to this program, especially also the State Board of Education, the County Boards of Education, and of course, all the principals, teachers, and the CIS caseworkers around all of our state that love these kids and just want them to succeed, and they're doing it. Although this pandemic, all, all, I mean, throughout all this pandemic, Communities and Schools program has set an example of how to maintain relationships with these students and ensure the continued success even while interaction has been surely limited. Now, uh, the, I, I guess I was just looking because, you know, I just wanted to make sure, you know, that, that, you know, there was a person here in the room that was trying to tell me something, but it wasn't in regard to this at all. Uh, again, just wrapping this up, I tell all our legislatures great work. I tell everybody that's involved in this program great work. I mean, I could see it and, and see it absolutely because Every time I'm in a school and I see these people that are working with these kids, I get it. Now, what we should do is just this. Well, you've got a horse that is running and running and winning race after race after race. We need to bet on that horse. We need to bring communities and schools to every county, every single county in this state, and we're gonna help lots and lots and lots of kids. I'm really proud of everybody and congratulations in every way. Now, if I could just go through some more, some more you know, things. We have our free testing for our minorities and all of our vulnerable West Virginians Friday and Saturday, June the 12th and 13th in Greenbrier, Hancock, Logan, and Wood Counties. Also testing next Saturday, June the 13th in Grant, Hampshire, and Hardy County. Please come out. The more tests we have, the better work we're gonna do here. Keep coming out and everything, and we're, we'll make that just happen better and better. On a jails update, let me tell you just this. Imagine this, eight days. In eight days, we have tested 10,000 inmates and 4,000 employees. I told you that it would be done on the 12th, it's done on the 12th. You know, and uh, the overwhelming results naturally are negative. We have nine active COVID-19 cases in five jails and two prisons, and, uh, and you know, we're still waiting, you know, on, on some additional results that are coming in, but uh, the overwhelming results are, are, are negative right now. I'm sure we'll have a few more positives when we get all the results in, uh, but uh, all this done, eight days. Good work, people, good job. And uh, let me see, okay. If I could jump back here real quick, you know, uh, you know, the, you know, again, I, I, we, we're trying to encourage, we want, we've done it and done it and done it, our cities and our counties to continue to apply for the CARES Act money. You know, as of this moment, 
right this moment, we have sent out $2.6 million. That's $2.6 million to our cities and our counties. And we're getting the funds out the door as fast as we possibly can. And, uh, and so we, now we have 61 applicants and we like naturally we got to follow the guidelines that the federal guidelines are out you know that we have to do and everything but we're constantly communicating with these people and and of these 61 applicants i hope we're going to be able to shove out the door a whole bunch more dollars uh now <clears throat> imagine we still have the possibility of as much as 280 cities and counties you know together that could still apply uh, you know, we're, we're working with the counties, the county association and the municipal leagues every single day, you know, and uh, we're going to continue to do that. And, and like I said, we just want to keep, keep the money going as fast as we possibly can. Uh, today, as far as our workforce update, uh, you know, Director Scott Atkins is on with us. He'll, he'll be talking. He'll be talking about one thing that everybody is really watching and trying to stay on top of in every way, and that's the, these claims that are coming in that are just flat out fraudulent. I think he's going to tell you that, a, I don't know, it's a gigantic number, maybe 39,000 claims that came in. There's an incredible percentage of those that are fraudulent, and what they're doing is basically just this. You know, probably there'll be some that'll slip by, but at the end of the day, they are hurting great West Virginians. They are hurting you that really need to be able to have your applications processed and your dollars coming to you because they're slowing us down. You know, crooks, criminals, they don't really care about you. We really do. But you've got to understand by what they're doing has got to slow us down. Because now we are micromanaging every single application and every single everything. It, uh, it's a crying shame. It's people that just try to stand back and take advantage. You know, I, I don't like it, and uh, I hope and pray that uh, they'll get their deserve. And so uh, now the summer feeding program I want to remind you, and in, in our maps up there, we have 670 sites. Over 5,000 people have used this map so far. Now just think, that's 5,000 probably families that are hungry. And so great work for us being able to, to help and help out, and we absolutely all need to continue to step up and try to feed our, ki our, our, our kids, our elderly, and, uh, you know, it's hard for a lot of us to imagine being hungry. It's hard for a lot of us that, you know, go through our daily lives and never let that enter your mind. What if you had to think? What if you had to think all day long, where's my next meal going to come from? Am I going to make it in everything? It would be, it would be horrible, wouldn't it? And so with all that being said, let's try to make sure that every West Virginian is fed and hope and pray that maybe we can take this terrible, terrible thought process away from everybody to where we just don't have to worry about where the next meal is going to come from. Uh, I remind you about the census, and uh, I'll end by saying this, and I think, uh, I, you know, that... Uh, this weekend coming up on uh, tomorrow and Sunday are going to also be free fishing days. No license is required in these two days. So if you haven't fished for a while and you're interested in learning or getting out and everything and going and having a good time, try it. It's free these days. And especially, I think, you know, if you could think about getting on a trout stream, we still got good water in the stream, still got a lot, a lot of fish that are out there and everything. And uh, it's a perfect time for a son or daughter or grandchild, you know, to have to go to their favorite fishing spot or, or, or come and to learn a new favorite fishing spot and, and uh, catch a big fish and everything. It, it's, a, it's a big thrill and everything. And I, I promise you at some point in time over this weekend, 
I'm going to have our grandson, JC, and we're going to be fishing somewhere. So, uh, so please, you know, please go do that, and, and, and we hope you'll enjoy in every way. It's, uh, it's a great way to enjoy family and connect with the beauty of all there is in the outdoors. It's a, it's a, you know, everyone knows how much I love the outdoors. I love to hunt and fish, and I've just grown up in the outdoors, and I, I'm, 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 to be perfectly honest, I'm eat up with it. I love it in every way, and so, so go fishing. It, it's, a, it's a great, great, great time, and uh, enjoy yourselves, and congratulations again to communities and schools and all the good work they did, and I'm going to go to our charts real quick, and then I'm done. You know, our charts from the standpoint of our, our active cases and recovered cases, the active still are dipping down. I think the last report I told you we had like 612 or something like that. We've got five, 590, I believe the number is now, and we've got 1,553 that are recovered and, and the widening continues. That's what you see it right there. That's what we want to have happen, you know, from, from the beginning of May until now. You see where we began May, we, get, we, we began May with almost as many active cases as we had recovered and we've, we've really widened that, 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 that chart and that's what we wanted to have happen. You know, the next chart, you know, I, I keep telling people if you'll look way back to the beginning of May, we had spikes of 12%, 11%, 8%, 6%, 7 on and on and on. The, the, the cumulative average at that time was between 4, 4.5 and 5, and, and, and then from about May the 20th forward, we started really dropping down. Now, today... We have another record. Today, we have a cumulative average today of 1.80. You know, it's, uh, we're pumping out numbers that are record after record after record in West Virginia. And, and all I would tell you is just keep doing that, West Virginia. You're doing great, but, but, just remember, we lost 86 good people. 86 really good people. The last one was a 50, 50 year old man. You know, um, please, please be cautious. Keep all these people in your thoughts, your prayers, and please protect yourself. As you protect yourself with a mask or whatever it may be, or just good sense, or you look after the elderly, just good sense, you absolutely will keep pumping these numbers out we'll be able to do more and more and more and absolutely our economy is going to thrive you're going to thrive west virginia is thriving right now and west virginia is going to thrive more and more and more congratulations keep it up all right thank you governor let's first go to scott adkins the commissioner of workforce west virginia uh, thanks jordan and good afternoon as governor justice said workforce west virginia is seeing the increase in fraudulent unemployment claims particularly connected to the new uh, Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program from organized criminals and for folks who are just trying to gain the program. PUA benefits are intended for self-employed workers who normally do not qualify for unemployment benefits, but were authorized to receive benefits by the CARES Act. To date, Workforce has distributed more than $200 million in PUA benefits to more than 24,000 eligible claimants. As Governor Justice mentioned, Workforce has received more than 35,000 fraudulent PUA claims since June the 1st. So in, in 11 days, we've received 35,000 fraudulent PUA claims. Scammers using stolen, stolen personal information from earlier national data breaches have been attempting to file fraudulent unemployment claims through the PUA system. This is not unique to West Virginia, it's happening in, in every state and territory across the country. Another common form of fraud is purposely misrepresenting a material fact to obtain or attempt to obtain benefits. For example, uh, folks who may be eligible for PUA benefits, but when they do their weekly certifications, they don't um, identify the earnings correctly or misreporting their employment status 
or refusing to return to work and not reporting it, that's also considered fraud. West Virginia is one of many states working in close collaboration with state and federal, state and federal law enforcement and regulatory agencies to investigate and prevent fraud. We've had the Department of Justice here this week. We're working with the U.S. Attorney's Office, the FBI, USDOL, OIG. We've identified several folks here in the Charleston area who are responsible for some of the fraud. And I can tell you, those folks are gonna be aggressively pursued and prosecuted to the full extent of the law. Workforce's Fraud Prevention Unit remains committed to preventing, identifying and blocking scams and is continuing its aggressive efforts to do so. The Fraud Unit's top priority is to protect unemployment claimants and make sure money distributed by workforce is going to valid unemployment claims. Unfortunately, as Governor Justice mentioned, unemployment fraud delays claims processing and causes great harm to many citizens at a time when they are most vulnerable. What it does for workforce and what it means for workforce is that we have to handle each of those cases individually. We have to verify identification. Folks have to upload information into the PUA system. We have to run those files against national databases, uh, against the Social Security Administration. So it's gonna take a little longer, unfortunately, to process those claims, which can cause a delay from folks who need those benefits and have been waiting for several weeks. It's especially tolerable that criminals are trying to take advantage of unprecedented public health emergency and scam states all across the country of unemployment benefits. We're taking the necessary steps, I can assure you, so that we can get PUA payments into the pockets of eligible individuals who've applied for those benefits and deserve those benefits as quickly as, as possible. To minimize fraud as of June the 2nd, eligible PUA claimants will receive their benefits either by uh, the key bank debit card or by a check. One of the scams that's perpetrated against unemployment benefits are folks who sign up for a legitimate uh, claimant and then have those funds deposited into a, a prepaid card, like a green dot card or a chime card. There's quite a few of those cards. So once those claimants' identities are verified, folks who are eligible for PUA benefits will be notified and they will be uh, permitted to sign up for direct deposit. This scam is a good reminder for all West Virginians to keep a close eye and remain vigilant to protect your identity and personal information. To uh, report unemployment fraud, it's real easy. You can email workforce at report unemployment fraud at wv.gov. Again, that's report unemployment fraud at wv.gov. And we investigate and take every one of those um, reports seriously. Thank you. All right, thank you, Scott. Next, we'll go to Major General Hoyer with the West Virginia National Guard. Good afternoon. A couple items to highlight today. As the governor pointed out earlier, significant amount of testing going on over the next couple of weeks. Uh, National Guard is involved in a pretty significant amount of support to public health as well as our local health department uh, partners with a, a large number of testing lanes going across the state uh, uh, today and tomorrow and throughout next weekend. Uh, also, we will be on Sunday supporting our partners at the uh, Division of Corrections with a uh, fairly large sanitization effort at Huttonsville Prison related to the outbreak there. Also want to remind folks that we continue to work hard uh, at sourcing PPE as well as the development of our own PPE. It continues to be a national shortage in protective equipment. Also uh, working on some unique efforts to uh, improve our ability uh, long term to test in a cost effective manner. Uh, in addition, a significant amount of support going on to state agencies, as well as higher education and the State Department of Education as we uh, begin plans to open back up schools and higher education uh, in the fall. Uh, last thing I'd like to leave everybody with is a little bit of history on Sunday is the 245th birthday of the Army. And I want to remind our West Virginia viewers that uh, the West Virginia National Guard traces its lineage back to 1735, a militia company in the western portion of the Virginia colony known as West Augusta. And that unit has been in continuous service since it helped form the Continental Army in 1775 at the direct request of General George Washington. 
the 201st Field Artillery, West Virginia National Guard at Fairmont, known as the First West Virginia, as a battle streamer from 1775 and is currently the oldest serving military unit in the United States Army. Not just the National Guard, but the United States Army. So we as a, as a, a citizenry have been supporting uh, the, the protection and support to our nation since the formation of the, of the Army itself and even before we were a state. Thank you. Thank you, General. Next, we'll go to Dr. Clay Marsh, our coronavirus czar. Well, good afternoon. I would be remiss if I didn't say happy birthday, General, and thank you and all the good people from our state that have served both in the National Guard and the Armed Forces uh, uh, for an amazing uh, debt of gratitude that we all have uh, for the freedoms that we um, experience each day. Um, I'd like to limit my comments um, to say, as the as the governor has um, has uh, articulated, that as we continue to move forward and, and move out and and be out together, we want to make sure that we are providing the right information so that it's safe for every West Virginian. And we know that in countries that have successfully navigated this coming back out and in fact never really closing down then three C's are important to remember, and that is to be careful about big crowds, to be careful about constant contact with people that you don't live with all the time, and to be cognizant of trying to avoid closed spaces. We know from all of the research that's come out, and many people have said, boy, it's really confusing what health people are saying and, and what the science is. I would say that everybody is moving toward an agreement that there's three things that we can do to really protect ourselves. And a fourth one is, is probably helpful as well. Number one is we can maintain a healthy physical distance between each other. We know that six feet is a good distance and the farther we separate in, in that six feet even farther, the more benefit we gain because the COVID virus spreads by droplets, by um, aerosols from people talking and singing and, and screaming, et cetera, and even just breathing, so that we know that being separated can reduce the ability of those droplets to enter another person's um, nose or, or mouth, which can affect them, or eyes. Number two is we can wear a face covering or a mask, particularly when we're going to be closer to other people, uh, any inside type of environment, but even outside if you're gonna be around a, a number of other people. And remember that protects you who may be infected and, and, and not realize it from infecting other people. And even the World Health Organization has just sanctioned a study that came out in the journal of Lancet because they were sort of uh, not clear about the benefit of masks, but that paper, I think in a very uh, clear and, uh, and, and confident way, uh, demonstrated that masks are really effective. And number three is that we want to make sure that you stay outside as much as you can and that you keep your hands clean. Wash your hands and, and use sanitizer or soap and water. And the number four that may actually benefit too is eye covering. But if we follow the stay a safe distance and wear a face covering when we're around other people and keep our hands clean, I believe very confidently that we will be able to reopen West Virginia to all the wonderful activities that we all enjoy and do it really safely. So thank you. All right. Thank you, Dr. Marsh. Next, we'll go to Secretary Bill Crouch with the West Virginia DHHR. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, as uh, I've talked about uh, on several occasions, uh, in the midst of this uh, pandemic, West Virginia continues to face a substance use epidemic. Um, I have some good news on, uh, on that front. Uh, DHHR has provided funding to expand our quick response teams uh, in the state in Berkeley, uh, Boone, Marion, and Mingo counties uh, to reduce the number of, of, of overdose deaths uh, and, and non-fatal overdoses uh, in those counties. Uh, quick response teams or QRTs assist individuals who have experienced an overdose uh, with recovery, support, social service referrals, and links to treatment options uh, in the state. Uh, these multidisciplinary teams are comprised of a first responder, 
a peer recovery support specialist, a law enforcement officer, and a member of the faith-based community. Uh, QRTs are now operating in 22 of West Virginia's counties. Uh, they're critically important to services provided to, to the uh, substance use community. Uh, to learn more, you can log on to our website uh, and uh, find out more about uh, the substance use epidemic and uh, what we're doing to combat that. Thank you. All right, thank you, Secretary Crouch. Uh, once again, we're holding today's briefing with media members joining us virtually to practice good social distancing. First questioner we have today is Annie Moore with WVVA. Good afternoon. I believe it was mentioned yesterday that the R0 number was creeping up in southern West Virginia. Do you have any more details on the plan to ramp up testing here? Annie, I'm going to defer to Dr. Marsh, and Dr. Marsh is our expert, especially on this question, but Dr. Marsh? Yes, thank you, Governor, and thank you, Annie. So we are working very closely with local health departments in the area. As the governor said earlier, we have a testing site set up for uh, Logan County this weekend, and we hope that people come out. And working with the Bureau of Public Health and DHHR and local health departments, we are planning additional testing uh, in the southern counties that, uh, that we see that are uh, not level going up to make sure that we understand what's exactly going on. All right, thank you, Annie. Next, we'll go to Paul Mullen with WCBC. Good afternoon, Governor. Good afternoon, panel. Uh, Governor, I'd like to talk about the roads program in West Virginia and what has happened during the pandemic. Did you curtail that a little bit to deal with the budget shortfall that was anticipated? And if so, will it be ramped back up again to try to repair some of these back roads in the, the counties? Uh, it's it, Paul, if, if, I mean, let me, let me just say this, I, I just wanted to make sure I got the name right, but Paul, there, uh, there has been some curtailment. It was primarily weather driven. We had so much rain and everything in the early spring, and it was primarily weather driven and absolutely you're going to see a real significant ramp up as we go forward at this point in, at this point in time toward the fall. So, uh, so I, I think we'll be, I think you'll, you'll, you'll see, you'll probably get tired of orange cones a lot of different places because we're going to be everywhere and uh, all, all across all 55 counties. All right, thank you, Paul. Next, we'll go to Steve Adams with Ogden Newspapers. Uh, yeah, Steve Adams with Ogden Newspapers here. I uh, want to turn to a press release that came out earlier today from Senator Manchin. He's introducing a bill called the Local Government Relief Act, uh, which I'm not sure exactly what it does as far as penalties, but it basically requires the 45% uh, of uh, CARES Act funding for cities and counties to be dispersed uh, uh, by June 30th. Uh, and then requires a report if a city can't do that. Uh, I had talked to the Municipal League and the County Commissioners Association and gotten statements back from them. They said they've, that they've had uh, conversations with you all throughout all of this in regards to the funding, and they seem to point to a lot of the red tape that uh, the U.S. Treasury has put on the funding for why it's taking a little while. Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on this mansion press release and this bill that has uh, that he's proposed. Thank you. Okay, everybody. I mean, everybody. Everybody would know. You know, from my standpoint, I, I always try to. Uh, I don't dodge questions. I give you just a straight scoop as best I possibly can, and as direct as I can give it. I mean, this is this is more political junk. That's all there is to it. It's just political junk. I mean, the bottom line of the whole thing is just this. Congress, not the state of West Virginia, Congress wrote the rules. They're the ones that right off the get-go came out and said, it's clear as mud, exactly what you're supposed to do. Well, we have a fleet of lawyers, you know, a mile long, and everybody in the world working on this to try to pump this money out as fast as we possibly can to everywhere. Why in the world, I mean, please pray tell somebody, tell me, why in the world Jim Justice, especially in an election situation, 
wouldn't be absolutely just sending money all over the place everywhere he possibly could if he, if he had the ability to do so. But the real, the real truth is just this. This is just a political stunt and everything. At the end of the day, I, I got the press release about three minutes ago, and I read one line. I want to read this one line to you. This is a direct quote, and this is a, a quote from Senator Manchin. He says, but the local governments in West Virginia haven't seen a penny of that money. And you just heard me say that we've sent out $2.6 million. Now, let me tell you, first of all, you know, if Congress would have sent us something out, right out of the get-go that, that people could understand and read and everything, these dollars wouldn't be parked over there and sitting over there. We are absolutely processing, processing applications just as fast as we can. We're talking to the municipal leagues. We're talking to the counties nonstop. I want to read you another quote, and I'll read you a quote that came from the counties and the cities and everything. It says, we appreciate West Virginia's leaders keeping the local governments involved as we can move forward with an unprecedented period. The CARES Act funding is imperative for local governments to, uh, you know, and local counties and everything. It goes on and on to say, the, you know, it's the best way to help our counties and our cities. Well, I mean, crying out loud, that's exactly what we're doing. Exactly what we're doing. We're going to continue to absolutely talk and we're going to continue to pump every single dollar out of this, out of this state as we possibly can to our cities and counties and we're going to help them and we're going to, we work with it every day. All they got to do is apply through our portal and we're going to get the money out the door. We got to stop this crazy, absolute politics. I mean, that's all there is to it. I have said it until I'm blue green. You know, at the end of the day, we've honestly got to stop this. We got to all line up on the same side of the fence and pull the rope together. That's what we've tried to do here. And that's what I'm going to try to do and continue to try to do. And that's all there is to it. So, uh, so I don't like this kind of stuff, but I guess you got to live with it. All right, thank you, Steve. Next, we'll go to Amanda Barron with WSAZ. Hi, everyone. Amanda Barron with WSAZ. Happy Friday. Uh, with the R not creeping up in southern West Virginia, rural hospitals already having trouble across the state and country. What specific plans are in place to ensure that they would be ready in the event that there was some sort of surge in those cases um, in an area with the most vulnerable population, and where can we read those plans? Clay, let me, let me talk just a second, and I'm gonna to defer to you, but uh, Dr. Marsh, let me just say this, Amanda. You know, first and foremost, we are watching the situation in our southern counties like crazy, because our southern counties, you know, may not have the number of hospital beds or, or whatever it may be, you know, to be able to, to handle a surge type situation. We're watching. I want this, our southern counties to, I don't, I don't want us to alarm them. You know, we're watching and everything. And, and I think if they just keep continuing to try to do everything they possibly can to do all the things from social distancing to keeping places super clean and doing all that kind of stuff, I think we're gonna be just fine. But Dr. Marsh can better answer, you know, how we're watching and what we're looking at, you know, if we have a situation break out. And I underline, everybody should understand, whether it be Southern West Virginia, Central, Northern, Eastern Panhandle, no matter where it may be, there will be a problem. There's going to be problems. This disease is right here. You know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you, oh, don't worry a bit about anything, everything's good. There will be problems and there will be still rough seas. And when there are rough seas, just like at Huttonsville, what did we do? We ran to the fire. And we ran to the fire like crazy, and we have zero deaths, and we have a total number that is almost so minuscule now of people that are still sick, it's unbelievable. That's what we would do anywhere, whether it be Southern West Virginia, Eastern Panhandle, Northern West Virginia, whatever it may be. Anyway, Dr. Marsh. So thank you, Governor, and thank you, Amanda. Um, so as the governor said, uh, one of the, the running to the fire sort of initial moves that we uh, will are making and, and will make in the future 
is as we see more activity and the R naught levels or the RT levels is what we're measuring now, which implies that some people are already exposed to the COVID virus. We are looking to identify how deep and, 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 and how uh, much community driven the problem is and doing our case investigations with the Bureau of Public Health, the local health departments already, but also trying to find people that might be super spreaders to be able to spread the disease to others. As we said, a very small number of people who are infected with COVID apparently do infect a number of other people, and we're looking for those people. If it comes down to people getting sick and needing hospitalization, we're working with the West Virginia Hospital Association, working with our big systems, you know, in the Southwest with Mountain Health and Marshall University in the central part of the state with CAMC and certainly in the sort of central to central, north central to northern part of the state and eastern part of the state with WV Medicine. And what we are doing is we're supporting the smaller communities and community hospitals and health centers with the larger um, uh, tertiary and quaternary care hospitals uh, in the area so that we can use the, the access and the, um, and the capacity of these larger hospitals to help support parts of the state that may not have the capacity or the ability to handle people if they become very critically ill in the future. And as the governor said, we are anticipating that we will see issues that happen as, as we go forward with COVID. And we believe that we're in good shape to do that. So thank you. All right, thank you, Amanda. Next, we'll go to Charles Young with WV News. Hi, Charles Young with WV News. Uh, Governor, I have a legislative question for you. Um, in the, you know, in Tuesday's primary, Senate President Mitch Carmichael uh, was defeated. Um, previously, you know, uh, Tim Miley chose not to run. Roman Prezioso chose not to rerun. What are your hopes for the next era of legislative leadership? And how do you think these changes will affect your relationship with the legislature? Well, you know, Charles, I, you know, you, 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 you really and truly hate to see people lose that, uh, you know, whether they have never been elected or they're incumbents and whatever. And, and, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people put their, uh, their heart and soul in, in their effort. And when they lose, you know, there's no point in anyone sitting on the sidelines saying, well, I told you so, or I told you this, or I told you that, or I really don't care, or whatever like that. I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to become that person. But, uh, but, you know, somebody's got to win and somebody's got to lose. And as we go forward, you know, that's the wonderful part about this democracy is, you know, we, we have a way of expressing our, our, ourselves at the voting booth. And then as we go forward, we, we make it work. Now... At the end of the day, what my recommendation to, be, to everyone would be is just what I have done over and over and over. And that's just exactly this. We are too polarized. You know, we became polarized on issues with our educators, which was, you know, I mean, for crying out loud, we didn't, we didn't need to become polarized, you know. We become, is, we become polarized on issues that are, it's fine and dandy for us to talk about or, or argue about and everything. And, but at the end of the day, we have got to realize one thing, and it is absolute gospel truth, you know, and that is for decades and decades and decades, West Virginia pitched 50th over and over and over. Now, we have absolutely risen way, 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 way out of that. Through a miracle from God, we have been able to come out of this pandemic thus far in a good way. Now, I would just tell everyone just one thing. How are we going to go forward in the most prosperous way? We need to check our politics at the door and leave them at the door. We need to work together as absolute West Virginians. And, and, and at the end of the day, when I came to you 
I came to you as an, as an individual with no agenda, and I came to you to serve. That's all I did. I came to you to serve. Now, whether your views on education were one way or another, the bottom line is just this. You had, you had a, a group of people that truly believed that they were you know, unmotivated, they, they absolutely needed higher pay raises, we had, we had classrooms without teachers and everything else. And then you had others on the other side that believed we can do a lot better in education. Both people had a good idea. Both people had a good idea. We just didn't need to have a food fight about it, you know. And so at the end of the day, I want West Virginia to continue to move forward. I don't want us to be on, on the national scene, you know, with something that, that pulls West Virginia back down. I want West Virginians to all work together, irregardless of party, and we'll find a way to do so. And I want all West Virginians to think just this way. You know, if someone lost in a race, we don't need to say, well, I told you this or this and that or glad you did or whatever it may be. We don't need to get into all that. We need to say those people were, were troopers in the fact that they put themselves out there. They put their lives out there and everything. They ran for public office and everything. It's a tough thing to do and everything. So, uh, so you know, I... I I, I'm surely not going to be one of those naysayers, and I'm going to be one that appreciates them and thanks them for their service. Thank you, Charles. Next, we'll go to Mark Curtis with Next Star Media. Happy Friday, everyone, from the TV 13 newsroom. Um, I guess this is mainly directed at Dr. Marsh and Bill Crouch. Are you guys uh, specifically monitoring the 20 states where we've seen a, a relapse or a resurgence? Are we seeing any commonalities or things that would be, uh, we better not do that here in these 20 states that are having a spike? Um, how close are you watching that? And what are your lessons learned? Governor? Go ahead. Bill, you want to start? You want me to? Ah, uh, go ahead, Clay. Okay. So um, thank you for the question, Mark. Of, of course, we are watching um, all of the states in, in the country that are seeing an upsurge in, in the number of cases. And we're also watching uh, places internationally who have also had problems and have started to address those. And I think the common denominator, Mark, that you see is you see uh, a lot of places where, you know, after the uh, states have opened back up for business, there has been a lot of, um, of, of movement of the populace to get back out and, and start to you know, enjoy their, their states and, and, and their, their freedoms and the businesses that are open. Um, but, but there's really two issues that I think are starting to complicate that for the states that are having problems and, and certainly the states that are seeing increases in hospitalizations, which is about nine of those states and ICU uh, hospitalizations, and particularly that's Arizona, is, is number one, as we've talked about, you know, with protests from the, from the death of George Floyd and others, you know, people have been really gathered together. So as we've talked about these three C's, we see a lot of crowds that are forming. Uh, in addition, in beaches in Florida and beaches in Texas, you see pictures of a lot of people that are out and, and they're close together and, and, and perhaps not wearing face coverings or masks. So that distancing and, and the mask wearing is a, is a real issue. And, and as we look at mobility data from phone use and, and that's tracked by Google and others, we see that there's a lot of mobility for people in a lot of these states that are both moving around and moving out of state and people are coming into those states. So we see a, a real burst in tourism as people have been sort of stuck in their houses. And that's the same thing we're watching here in West Virginia as we've discussed and in the beautiful parts of our state that attracts people from other states. So, so I would say, in, in, at least from my own perspective, it's really about people that are gathering in crowds and around people they don't live with. Uh, for prolonged periods of time without face coverings or masks, uh, and also with a 
tourist population that's starting to come in that may bring COVID into these areas. Bill? Yes, I'm Clay, that's right on target. Um, if you look at the pictures uh, on television of other states and the, the, the fact that folks are not socially distanced, uh, distancing, they're not wearing masks, um, the governor opened West Virginia up slowly. Uh, he did that so that uh, we could ease in back into some sort of normal life, which we all want. Uh, and what the governor's asking is that as we open West Virginia up, we continue to do uh, what you've done in the first uh, phase, first wave of this uh, pandemic. Uh, we're all, those of us who are deeply involved in this, one of our biggest concerns is, is, is the second wave and what's gonna happen. So we all worry about that. We all watch these numbers. We watch what's going on in other states. We watch what's going on in Arizona and South Carolina. Um, so we, we please ask you to continue doing what the governor has asked. He has stayed on top of this from the standpoint of, of, of advice from, from, uh, from Clay and, and from everyone else in terms of what will stop this from, from uh, turning West Virginia into one of those other states. So, so please uh, continue doing what you're doing. If we do that and, and we protect ourselves and we protect our families and, and especially protect our, our, our loved ones, our elderly uh, uh, parents, grandparents, et cetera, uh, we'll get through the second wave as well. So thank you. All right, Governor, I'll turn it back to you. Okay, uh, well, to end up, we ended up on a Friday, and, uh, and every Friday that we end up on, you know, I caution you, we got to go through a weekend, uh, you know, I want you to go out and enjoy the beautiful sunshine in this beautiful, beautiful state in every way, and I caution you to be safe and, and be smart, because, uh, you know, we're going to now go a couple of days that we're going to be apart and everything, but... Uh, but next week we will go on Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And Thursday could be moved to Friday. I've got a previous uh, engagement that I've got to do on Friday, and so, so if that if that's if that's you know we have to do have to we'll go Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday of next week. Uh, again, I want to congratulate uh, the the birthday of our Army and and our National Guard and and General Hoyer was kind enough to to give us another history lesson today, which we all appreciate, and, uh, and, and, and the knowledge of, uh, of the very people that made this great nation and made this great nation is into what we are, and, uh, and now looks after and protects and gives so much and always asks so little. I say that so many times, but uh, we owe every single thing that we have in this great country to all those that have served and are serving in our military branches. So. We thank them from the bottom of our hearts. Uh, I want to leave by just saying this. We had a question in regard to, uh, you know, our Senate president, Mitch Carmichael, our past speaker, Tim Miley, and, uh, and, I, and Roman Prezioso, who led us on uh, the other side of the aisle in, in the Senate. And, uh, and, and, and I, I want to end by just saying this. Uh, a special thanks to them for the years of their service and all the great stuff that they have given this state. We absolutely should, should uh, rise above our politics and, and think just how much they gave. And, uh, and so for that, we should sincerely thank them. I congratulate all the winners, and I absolutely want us to absolutely be thankful for all those that were kind enough to serve and. Uh, and, and put their name on the ballot, because this day and time, that's tough stuff. So, so nevertheless, uh, as we go forward, I'd say to West Virginia, please be safe, you know, please love our state and love our people. You know, I, I think there's probably a bunch of you out there that love it as much as I do and everything, but there's nobody's gonna love it anymore. God bless you, thank you. <laughs>